Well, good morning, Renewal Church. I'm so glad that you have joined us for our last virtual gathering. Uh, it's kind of a, a bittersweet, but more sweet than bitter as we kind of move on to the next stage as we uh, prepare to regather again next Sunday. So just a reminder that we will gather at Hilton uh, the hotel that's right across from Canes and Rosa's and close to the hospital. So we'll regather there starting next Sunday at 10 a.m. And it will be a sweet time um, as we sing together and we listen to the word together and we get to see each other once again. And so we look forward to that. But as for today, um, it will be a good day of worship as we continue our tapestry series as Matthew preaches about creation today. And I look forward um, to hearing stories about how God has worked this morning. So as we gather this morning together online, I mean, I can't help but approach this gathering with a heavy heart. One of the things that's just kind of unusual or challenging about having these online gatherings is that we actually record on the Tuesday and just the way our schedule has worked. And so whenever you're preaching or we're talking about things that are happening today in our very fast changing world, five days, a lot can happen. And we've seen that with COVID and we're seeing that right now with the, the reality just in the wake of the George Floyd, just tragic and horrifying death and how our, our country is just being torn apart. And we are seeing just a tension that is just unsurmountable, it seems like, and it's just painful. And, and I mean, I'll be honest with you, I have a hard time even reading the news and watching video after video of beatings and riots and shootings and all of those images have been so painful. And I'm sure you're like me that you're approaching this gathering with the desire to celebrate because worship is celebrating, but lamenting is also a way of, of worship. And, and this morning as we gather in the first part of our service, we're gonna just really ask God to just heal our land. In 2 Chronicles 7, 14, God's word reminds us that if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. I don't think it's far-fetched for me to say that we need to pray for our nation, that God would heal our land with cities that are burning and with the, the pain and the hate that we're seeing all across. It seems like every day a new city is springing up with more rioting and looting and pain. And it's as though creation is just groaning and needing to be delivered. And so let's just pray here right now. And then the rest of the service be in a prayerful state as, as Katie is going to be leading us to to consider the word and to sing and to praise God while we are begging him to only God can do, which is to heal our land. Father, we thank you for the gift of prayer that we can come before you with full confidence that you hear us, that you are real and you are God who speaks and you are God who hears us and you are God who's on the throne and you care and you want and you want our, our land to be healed. And so we come before you as a church and we're just asking you to do what only you can do, the supernatural to bring healing and to bring peace and reconciliation and to break strongholds and, and to just restore us individually and restore this country and bring it back to you. Father, we're asking this morning that you would just calm our hearts that are just so torn and so broken. And there's just this, this havoc and this chaos that is just, just raging inside of us. So we're just asking for your peace. We're asking for your healing. We're asking for the manifestation of your glory. And we ask it for the sake of your kingdom, Jesus. We trust you. And we're seeking you today. We're bowing our hearts before you and asking you to heal our land. In Jesus' name, amen. 
as we join together in song this morning, um, I, I, I want us to sing a song. It's called Before the Throne of God Above. And it's just talking about how we can come to the Lord with our pleas, with our cries, with our, with our questions, with our doubts, and, and, with, our, um, and with our petitions. Um, and, and I know a lot of times we think of worship just as... Um, things we do and we're happy and overcome with joy, but we actually see in scripture that worship is so much more. Um, we see lamenting as a form of worship. Psalm 88, one through three says, Oh Lord, God of my salvation, I cry out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ears to my cry, for my soul is full of troubles. We can bring our troubles to the Lord, and that is a form of worship. Mourning and, and, and feeling grief and sorrow for what we're, we're seeing is, is, is also a form of worship. Matthew 5, 4 says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Uh, coming to the Lord in repentance of the ways that we've knowingly or unknowingly personally and corporately perpetuated racism is, is also a form of worship. Isaiah 1, 16 through 17 says, wash yourself and make yourself clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil and learn to do good. Seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless and plead the widow's cause. Um, I know another thing I've been feeling a lot too is just, man, anger against injustice and not knowing what to do with that, but bringing your righteous anger to the Lord is also a form of worship. Psalm 10, 12, the psalmist, express, the psalmist expresses, Arise, O Lord, O God, and lift up your hand. Forget not the afflicted. Break the arm of the wicked and the evildoer and call his righteousness to account till you find none. Advocating for the liberation from oppression is also a form of worship. Psalm 72, 4 says, May he defend the cause of the poor, give deliverance to the children of the needy, and crush, crush the oppressor. Crying out to God to end evil is also a just form of worship. It displays his character and who he is. Psalm 83, 1 through 2, and then 17 through 18 says, Oh God, do not keep silent. This is my prayer. Do not hold your peace or be still. For behold, your enemies make an uproar. Those who hate you have raised their heads. They lay crafty plans against your people. They consult together against your treasured ones. But let them be put to shame and dismayed forever. Let them perish in disgrace that they may know that you alone, whose name is the Lord, are the most high over all the earth. And like Matthew read earlier, asking for God to reconcile his people and to heal our land is a form of worship. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, and God is making his appeal through us. And so we implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. And if his people who are called by his name humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, I'll hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. So we're going to worship in a way that's a little bit different than what we've been doing in our online gatherings this morning. We're going to sing a song. Um, sing a verse and then spend some time praying specifically for some of those things the verse is saying and, and lifting up our heart cries um, of, of the things that we're just seeing seeing played out in our world. Um, I, I'm going to pray um, over over the mic in these verses but, but I also really invite you I would invite you to pray. Pray out loud. Pray in your soul. Pray with your face bowed to the ground. Pray with your hands lifted high. Um, so I invite you to, to also pray um, as, we, as we bring these pleas to the Lord. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. Lord, we come to you. The pleas we bring to you, God, we plea for mercy. 
God, you are a merciful God. Lord, and so we plea for your mercy. God, we, we plea, God, for comfort for the afflicted, comfort for those who, who mourn the loss of a friend, um, who mourn the, the loss um, and the fear of, of their of their families. God, we, we come for, please, God, for renewal for our souls to be in line with your grace. God, we come to you with, please, Lord, that you would heal our nation, God, that you would root out the evil and the sin of racism, God, that you would open our eyes and awaken our hearts to see how we could be your hands and feet in that fight. God, we come to you with those, please. We thank you, God, that you are our great high priest that hears, that who sympathizes with our weaknesses um, and that is on high hi. Um, our name is written on your hand and nothing can, can call us to depart, God. So we thank you for your power and the things that you can do, Lord. And we just lay these pleas um, and this sorrow and this grief, God, um, before you. Lord, come. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the we come to you, our sinless Savior. We pray, God, for justice for those who've been sinned against, Lord. We pray for forgiveness, God, of, of our sins, Lord. We pray for forgiveness for the sins of our nation, God. We pray for forgiveness, God, for this just the generations of oppression, Lord. We pray, God, you would forgive us for those sins, Lord. We thank you that you have paid that price, that you are a sinless Savior, God. We ask, Lord, that you would cleanse our hearts, God. You would purify us, Lord, to see people the way you see them and to love people the way you love them, God. Lord, we ask that you would break the stronghold, God, of the sin of racism, God, and of hatred and of anger and of fear, God. We pray that you would break those things down. Lord, we ask your God, the just, God, we ask for your justice to reign, Lord. We come before you humbly, God, and we ask these things, Lord, because we know they're in line with who you are and your character, God. So we ask these things, Lord. Behold him there, the risen lamb, my perfect spotless righteousness, the great unchanged. character, Lord, we know is unchangeable. God, you're perfect. You're spotless, God. You're our risen lamb, Lord. You're the king of glory and grace, God. So we pray, Lord, for your peace. Lord, we pray for a peace to just wash over, God, um, a real peace, God, that our souls could be at peace um, because we see you move um, and we unite our passions and desires to your passions and desires, God, for your people. Lord, God, we ask, Lord, that you can quiet our souls, God, that we can hear from you, Lord. We can hear from you the 
ways we could love better, God. The ways we can listen better. God, we remove ourselves, Lord. We humble ourselves, God, so that we can see our churches, our nation, ourselves the way you see us, God. Will you speak to us, Lord? Will you give us humble and willing souls, God, to listen? Lord, and God, we just pray that we would be able to rest in your love. Lord, we thank you, God. We thank you that your mercy is greater depths than we could ever know, Lord. Teach us more about your mercy, God, that we would dive even further into those depths and know what that looks like, God. Lord, we ask these things in your name because we trust you, God, we submit to your authority. I bow before the cross of Christ and marvel at this Lord, we want to lift up one more song to you in prayer together, Lord. We ask that you would hear this prayer. Um, we long for this day that we're going to sing about. We, we pray in faith for this day, God, when darkness would fade into a new beginning, when we would see um, new beginnings, God, of, of love and of reconciliation, God, and, um, and of justice, Lord. Um, God, we ask um, that, that you would give us hope, God, as we, as we await with expectation, God, as, as all creation's groaning, Lord. Declare the reign of the Lord our God, Lord. We, we ask, Lord, that you would break these strongholds, that they would have to surrender, God, as we sing in victory of our God who has overcome. If you have overcome the grave, Lord, we know and we trust and believe that you can overcome, Lord. And so we lift this song as a prayer to you, God. Hear our prayer. Now there's darkness fades. our eyes to hope beyond all creation waits with an expectation to declare the reign of the Lord our God we will not be moved when the earth gives way for the rage of what is overcome and for
when the earth gives away for the rain. an empty grave for the raising you have the power to overcome, Lord. So will you make us people who are your hands and feet, God, um, that link arms together, God, um, to, um, to overcome, God, the prejudices, Lord, and, and, and the, just the, the oppression, God, in our, in, our, in, our, in our land, God, in our world. Lord, we submit these things to you and we ask you to move, God, because we know this is something only the Lord Most High can do. Um, so we love you, God. We thank you, Lord, for hearing us, for allowing us to express these things like lament and mourning, God, and, 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 and anger and, and, um, and just, um, just pain, Lord, and the oppression. God, we thank you for hearing these prayers, God. We thank you for being a God, Lord, who overcomes. And we pray these things in Jesus' in Jesus's name. Amen. So as I shared earlier in a worship gathering, as we're here together, um, my heart is just so heavy. I, I can't hardly even watch the news where there's just this reality of just the pain that has torn apart our country where in, in the wake of, of George Floyd's just tragic death and there is just so much hatred and you see racism and you see tension and looting and rioting and it's just the scenes are just horrific i've had a hard time being able to even watch the news without being brought to tears and it i'm sure you can relate if you've been intaking too much media this week that man it's been hard and painful and just seeing the evil that is just rampaging across our world um it seems like we're seeing the worst that humanity has to offer here right now in this season. And, and it's hard because we're just now coming to the close of this COVID-19 quarantine. And so it's like right when the pandemic, it, it's still going, but we're beginning to gather again. And next week we'll have the joy of gathering together in person. And, and yet we still have to be distant when we're together and six feet apart. And so all of this just upheaval and uneasiness and anxiety that we're seeing across our land. And so it was good together today um, to just seek God's face and ask for his healing in our land and acknowledge that God hates racism and that there should be no part of it for a believer because God's plan is to save people from all nations. And maybe today with your heart being heavy, um, I don't know, like, I mean, for me, I'm asking myself like, man, how do you, how do you see God's purpose in all of this devastation? And, and maybe you can relate to saying, God, I wanna see your hand. I wanna see that you have a purpose and a plan and that your will will be done even in the middle of seeing our cities burning today. So if your heart is heavy, I believe that what we need most, all of us, whatever we're going through, whether it's you're burdened over what's happening in our country or whether something else that's more personal, whatever it is that we're going through, wherever your heart is today, 
I believe that what we need is a fresh encounter with God. We need to come face to face with our eyes of faith and just see the risen one and to hear his word today. Our souls are just craving and are desperate for a word from the Lord. And that is why we gather. We gather whether there's good news or bad news because our God has all the answers and all the hope and all the purpose. And so today we're going to hear from the Lord wherever you find yourself today in this season. We're going to continue in our series in our study in biblical theology. We're going to be identifying the primary themes that begin in Genesis in the Garden of Eden and these themes that are woven throughout the entire Old Testament that are pointing to Jesus, the Messiah, that are fulfilled and accomplished in the person the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus. And that those same themes that are then will culminate in eternity with the new heavens and the new earth. And so these beautiful biblical themes serve as threads that all come together and threads of many different diverse colors, but that create one stunning tapestry. And that's what we're looking at today of how God has woven these different themes into the fabric of the story that God is telling. And and the Bible, we saw this last week, is truly God's literary genius, where God is creating this masterpiece that's interwoven, and all of it is about Jesus and points to His redemption for the praise of His name. And so practically what we're learning as a church is how the Bible fits together, how it hangs together and how the Old and New Testament, all of it is about Jesus and all of the stories in the Old Testament have a purpose in the unfolding story that God is telling. And so we're talking about redemption through Jesus. That is the overall plot line of the Bible. And the Bible, again, from last week, it is God revealing himself to people. And so we're doing this series in this way because the prayer is that you would have a hunger for God's word, that that you would want to just feed your soul from the Bible and, and like not get enough of this, but just want more of it. Because the more that we are in awe of God and of his word, the more that we're going to know him better and walk in obedience to his will. So I'm praying for hunger, that you will hunger for God and his word. Today's sermon title is God's story. It's designed with purpose. The part of God's unfolding story is that he is the grand designer and he is designing everything in the universe with a particular and specific purpose. And so today we're looking at the biblical thread of creation. And so like we talked about this last week, Genesis 1 and 2 describes creation. Genesis 3 describes fall. And then chapter 3, all the way through Revelation 20, describes redemption. The very end, Revelation 21 and 22, describe consummation or the completion of God's purpose. So we're starting today at the very beginning of God's story in Genesis 1 and 2 by looking at creation. We'll look at fall next week in Genesis chapter 2. Three. And so today, as we dive into this biblical thread of, of creation, I just want to give you three truths, three simple but profound truths about the God who is the creator. And so truth number one about creation is we have the God who creates. And so everything about creation, number one, is that it is God who creates. So let's look at the God who is the Creator. So Genesis chapter 1. What you see in this chapter as the Bible opens, it's a panoramic view of 
creation. So a panoramic, if you have a cell phone, then what you can do is you can put it on panoramic mode and then you, you can start on this side and hit record and then you slowly will pan all the way across the landscape and then it threads it together and it has just one picture that's a panoramic, so a panorama. And so what, what you see with Genesis 1 is kind of like the, the, the panoramic or if you will like the blimp view from the aerial view of looking down and seeing the entire landscape of creation. That's Genesis 1, and it shows how God created everything that exists in the universe. So let's start there with Genesis 1, verses 1 through 5. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. There was evening, and there was morning the first day. Will you pray with me? Father, as we approach your word here today, as we see that you are the creator, you are the sustainer, and everything that exists has come from you and for you, we ask that your spirit that was hovering over the waters there in creation, when you spoke and you said, let there be light, we pray right here in this moment that you would shine your light into our hearts, that your spirit would be heavy on us and that we would hear your word, that we would receive your word and that we would be hungry for you, that we would see your Bible as this beautiful interwoven masterpiece and desire more of you and to know you better. So I just pray for your blessing, that you would open our eyes and our hearts, we would receive what you have to say to us today. Change us for your glory. Jesus, we pray in your name, amen. What you're seeing in Genesis 1 is God is showing how he created the entire universe in six days. Now, the first three days, so day one, we see here, we just read he created light. In day two, it says that he created sky and water and he separated them. He created the atmosphere and the sky and he created water. And then in day three, he creates land. So he creates mountains and all that you see on dry land on day three, along with the seas. He gathers the waters and he creates the oceans and the seas. And so the first three days, he is creating the shape of the universe. Then in the next three days, days four, five, and six, he is then populating or he is filling the earth that he has created. So in day four, he creates the sun and the moon and the stars. So he had already created the expanse and then he puts these lights, the sun to govern the day, the moon to govern the night, and he puts the stars in the universe and he knew the exact perspective we would have when we saw them that we would use for things like navigation and knowing the seasons and being able to tell time with the sun and so all of this God had planned it so he makes the sun and the moon on day four and the stars day five he fills the earth with fish and with birds so the skies and the waters he fills them and then day six he fills the land with all the land animals and he makes humanity the crown jewel of his creation creating and then filling the earth now genesis chapter 2 Let's read the first few verses in that, Genesis 2, 1, 2, and 3. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them, and on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. So Genesis chapter two 
begins at the first few verses with completing what began in chapter one on again, this panoramic view of creation and the seventh day God rests. Then chapter two, you see more of the, the grounds view. And so, so chapter two is the detailed view of creation. It's not the panoramic, it's the zooming in. So it's not the helicopter where you can see the forest. It's landing, walking into the forest and getting right up next to the trees and looking at the leaves in close detail. So it's the exact same forest, but one is the aerial view and the other one is a close up view with more detail. And that's Genesis chapter two where we see God creating humanity and interacting with, with people and our purpose is defined more clearly. So let's read a little bit in chapter two to kind of get a flavor for this. And we'll do chapter two, verses five through 10. When no bush or field was yet in the land and no small plants of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land and there was no man to work the ground. And a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. And the Lord planted a garden in Eden in the east. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to the water of the garden and there it divided and became four rivers. Let's jump down to verse 15, still in chapter two. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So the Bible here, God is revealing who he is and what he is doing and why he's doing it. So you see the explanation of how the universe came into existence. We're seeing that God made it. It was God's idea. Now I understand in the 21st century, that saying that God spoke and made the world and formed Adam out of dust and breathed life into him and how the Bible is defining our origin, that this flies in the face of modern day, just dominant science that defines that our world came into existence with this highly condensed mass about 15 billion years ago that had a sudden explosion or a big bang that set into motion what we now know as the universe over billions of years of evolution. So this atheistic Darwin mindset, this world's view that is so common today is not biblical because the Bible is so clear on how we came into existence. And if you would ask a physicist and say, well, okay, if, if the world existed through this big bang, well, where did the highly condensed matter that exploded, where did that original matter come from? Well, they don't really have an answer. And so it's fascinating to me how PhDs, very intelligent people, when, when they don't know the answer, they do what most of us would do. We make stuff up. They just make it up and they say, oh, well, there's a singularity. And as a using big, impressive words somehow helps explain what they can't explain. They say, well, you see, there's a singularity, which is a one-time occurrence where the laws of physics are suspended and it's, it's a one-time occurrence. And so there was a singularity which allowed this, this mass to exist and then to have a big bang. And then that has evolved into what we have today. And if you say, well, hold on a second, you're telling me that there was a one-time occurrence that is outside of the laws of physics and you weren't there and you can't know for certain and this is your theory. 
it sounds a lot like faith to me. Like that sounds to me like you're putting faith in something that you don't know, that you can't see, that you can't examine in the lab. And I think we need to just be intellectually honest and, and say that the Darwin worldview is a religion that requires faith. It requires believing that there is no God and believing in the singularity that led to the Big Bang. And yet what's so fascinating to me is you'll read books by these same atheists who claim to have no faith. And yet they'll write about things that are so intricate. So for example, the exact distance between particles at the subatomic level that have to be in perfect balance because all the various forces that are at play. And if there's even a slight degree change, then, then it, it, it won't work. It won't hold together. And, and how you have scientists that are absolutely amazed when they study subatomic particles. Or, or you, you read books about, again, atheist scientists that, are, that marvel at the human eye and how complex it is. And what's so amazing to me is when you read some of these things, it almost seems like they're worshiping. They're in awe of what they're discovering in the created universe. And yet they refuse to acknowledge that there's a creator and that there's a designer and that there is purpose. So I think it takes a lot of faith, even for the most indignant scientist to examine the universe and see how intricate it is. And then to say, oh, it's just physics. Stop admiring it. There's no design in it. It's just molecules bumping into molecules. No, it's not. And in the heart of man, we know that it's not. And the more that we discover about how God created the world, the more that we see that there is incredible design and that God's glory is being revealed in how he has created the world. God is the creator and he is creating to show his greatness. And so we first see here in Genesis one and two, that there is the God who creates. Number two, second truth. We see the God who creates with purpose. God created out of nothing. In the, in the original ex nihilo, out of nothing, he is creating. But the question is why? Why did God create in the first place? I mean, there must be a reason why God would choose to create. Well, there is a reason he did create for a purpose. And so let's talk for a minute about the purpose of God. Well, God's purpose is his glory. Everything that God does has exactly one purpose, which is to display, to show his infinite perfections. And so God's purpose in creation is to display how great and how amazing and how glorious and wise and creative and powerful he is. It is a display of his majesty. And at its essence, what happens to us is when we see it, we're spurred, we're propelled to be in awe and to worship. And so we exist to see the glory of God and to respond with hearts that treasure his glory. And that's what worship is. Worship at its essence is treasuring the glory of God, valuing his presence, desiring God. And so from this account that we just read, what is creation revealing about God that would lead us to be in awe of him? Well, let me give you three words on what creation reveals about God. One, it reveals the goodness of God. In Genesis 1, 3 and 4, 10, verse 12, verse 18, verse 21, verse 25, verse 31, over and over and over, God is creating. And at every point in creation, it says, and God saw and it was good. And it was good. And it was good. This refrain repeatedly. And then in verse 31, it says, God saw everything that he created and behold, it was very good. 
And so creation reveals that God is good and what he does is good. He loves his creation and he is moved to bless his creation. So we see the goodness of God. Number two, we see the beauty of God. Creation is a masterpiece and God is creative and it is stunningly beautiful when you see mountains or canyons or oceans or wildlife or gardens. We see how beautiful creation is because God is beautiful. When you look at people, people in all shapes and colors of all ages, of all backgrounds, people are beautiful because God has made us in his image to be beautiful. So we see the goodness of God. We see the beauty of God. We see truth. Creation is crying out that the creator is true, that he's real and that he is the truth. And so how does creation reveal God's truth? Oh man, his character is revealed. Creation shows that he is eternal. Before anything existed, God was there. Creation shows that God is powerful and that he is creative and that he is wise. I mean, think about things like chemistry and physics and different languages and everything about the world and how it all works together and who we are as people. It was God's idea. God thought of calculus and trigonometry and geometry. God thought of these things. It was his idea. He's wise and he built the world with these realities in it. So it shows that he is creative and wise, but also shows that he is sovereign. He is the king. He is the authority. And so he told Adam and Eve how to live and said, you will obey me and you will not eat of this fruit. He was in charge. He's the sovereign. And so we see the goodness, the beauty, and the truth of God. And our hearts crave it because creation is good because God is good. And creation is beautiful because God is beautiful. And creation is true because God is truth. And so creation is displaying the glory of God. But what does it say about us? What does creation say about human beings? Well, I want to read to you a few verses that we skipped over in Genesis chapter 1 verses 26 through 28. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them and God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. It says that God made us in his image. The image of God is not something that humans have or that humans do. Hear me, this is important. The image of God is not something that we have or what we do. The image of God is what human beings are. It's what we are. It defines us. They give the five key words. If you're taking notes, I hope you are. Five key words about the image of God to help you understand what this means for you and for me. It means the first one is that we relate. So the first key word is relate. Humans are relational. At our essence, that's what we are. God has designed us in his image to enjoy relationship with him and with each other. So God blessed Adam and Eve and God spoke to Adam and Eve and Adam and Eve could speak. The only creature that can speak are humans. And so speaking is a part of being made in God's image, ability to communicate with others and with God, the ability to love and to feel deeply, to feel affections for others and for God is part of being made in God's image because God does those things. God loves and God speaks and God relates. And so we relate. Second key word is reason. We can reason, we can think and have complex thoughts. Animals can't, trees can't, mountains can't. They're beautiful. And there are animals that are alive, but they can't reason the way a human being can. They can't enjoy art or language. They can't build a car and drive in it. They can't. They're animals. They can't reason the way humans can. 
They don't know right from wrong. Humans do. Part of many God's images that God thinks. And so we can think, we can reason. We're made to think as image bearers of God. And we need to learn to think. And so we relate, we reason. Number three, we rule. Part of God's image is that we rule. We just read that we were made to have dominion. And it says to subdue the earth. These are words describing a king having a kingdom who has a, dom- a domain and who is subduing. And so uh, application wise, what this means is that we're called to develop the social world. Sometimes this is called the cultural mandate. It means that God has given us the ability to create culture, to to take from the raw materials that God has made and for us to create, to use our skills and our abilities to do what? Well, things like farming, construction, fixing cars, developing software, making music, teaching history, teaching math or science or language. It's all about what God wants us to do because we reflect his image and we're discovering what he has built into this world. It's a part of his image bearers is to rule, to harness the raw materials and to develop society and to expand and to have discoveries. And so we're made to relate, to reason, to rule. Number four, we're made to rest. Men in God's image means that we rest Day seven, God rested. Was God tired? No, he wasn't tired. God is always at work, but he's always rested. He's always at rest and at peace. And he rested on the seventh day to give us the pattern. We need rest. We need to depend on God. And so humans from creation are dependent upon God. Adam and Eve were dependent on God before the fall. Because to be human is to depend on God, to need to rest our souls in Him. And so the image of God in us means that we rest in Him. And the fifth key word here is we reflect. As an image bearer of God, we reflect His glory. That is our purpose at its essence. What we are as image bearers is we reflect the character of God. Adam was the head of humanity who was tacked to lead all of humanity to cover the face of the earth and to have worshipers that would be from all nations who would follow the head Adam and would worship God. This was God's purpose to have a world covered with image bearers, reflectors of the glory of God. He says, fill the earth and multiply. Multiply what? Multiply worshipers across, across a whole planet that display God's glory. So this is what it means to be made in God's image. And so what is the purpose of God? God's purpose is to display his glory. What is our purpose? To reflect his glory as image bearers. This is why we exist. He's a God who creates with purpose. We'll look at this next week, but in chapter three of Genesis, there's the fall. Adam failed. He did not lead humanity to worship God. He gave in to the serpent. And because of that, because Adam didn't want God's love or God's presence or God's purpose, Adam wanted to be God himself. Because of his rebellion, trying to find his purpose in his own way and find joy elsewhere outside of God, because of his great evil, it has led to disaster and a corruption of our image of God, corruption of our purpose of displaying his glory, corruption, being able to relate to God, to know him and to enjoy him. The world is now broken. This is what you see where we don't reflect God's glory anymore. We distort it. There's decay and there's death and there's disease and there's pain in this world. So we have a God who is creating with purpose, but that purpose has been frustrated from our end, but God's purposes cannot be frustrated. It may seem like it, but God has a plan and nothing can stop, nothing can thwart the purposes of God, which is the third point in creation, the God who recreates. See, Genesis 3, there's fall, but everything from Genesis 3 
to Revelation is about God restoring creation to its original purpose through the Messiah. So the whole Old Testament points to this Messiah who will recreate his world and his people. So following the storyline, you get to chapter four of Genesis and you see great evil. It's like creation is unraveling and Cain kills his brother Abel and things get Worse, in chapter 6, the whole world is covered by people now, which was God's purpose. But instead of reflecting his glory, they're reflecting pain and corruption and death and evil. And so God's glory is not being displayed. It's being distorted. And humans are killing each other, just like we're seeing today in our country. It's so painful. So what did God do? We see that he raises up a man named Noah and Noah is presented as a new Adam in Genesis chapter nine, verses one, two, and three. It says, and God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. That is exactly what he told Adam. After the flood, which is a recreation where God destroys and this decreation with the flood, God then recreates the world, cleansed and made new with this new Adam, Noah. And he tells Noah to be fruitful and multiply. And he tells him to have dominion over the earth, just like he had told Adam to do. But the problem is that Noah it was sinful and his children begin to sin and all of a sudden the world gets covered with sin and brokenness all over again. So what does God do? He creates a new man. He creates Abraham. His first name was Abram. Abraham is the same basic name, but the, the, the word for spirit is ruach in Hebrew, and it's the sound of breath or of air flowing through your mouth. And so the name Abram and Abraham, Abraham, the difference is your breath. And so he was transformed. Abraham was transformed by the spirit of God. It was the Holy Spirit, the breath of God that transformed Abram from being a pagan to Abraham, who is a worshiper and who trusts God. And God promises Abraham that all of his descendants will be so many, you can't even number them. And one of them will be the Messiah who will come and recreate humanity because even though God did recreate Abraham, Abraham still sinned and died, but he pointed to the coming of the Messiah, Jesus, who would not die and would not fail. And we have a world that is in chaos and in, in turmoil. And yet we have a God who is at work through Jesus, who is recreating a people. You see it in the Old Testament. You see it with the Israelites when they get to the foot of Mount Sinai and God makes them, he creates them as his people when they receive his word at, at the mountain. Well, Jesus is the word of God who is recreating a people and is restoring us to his original Purpose. If you want to see this in the Old Testament, study Isaiah chapter 40 through 66. The last third of Isaiah is all about God's restoration of the new earth through the Messiah. And I'll read to you an excerpt from chapter 11 of Isaiah that the wolf shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard will lie down with the young goat and the nursing child shall play with the whole of a cobra and they shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. You hear that? This is the new earth. It says, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea a recreated earth where there is no violence and no death and a recreated people. So you will see one day a resurrected earth, a new earth with the resurrected people, a new people with the resurrected Messiah who will rule over them forever. Jesus is the new Adam who succeeded with the first Adam 
failed. Jesus is the true image of God who reflects God perfectly and restores us to the image of God. Jesus is the head of a new humanity and he is recreating us to share in his divine nature, a new nature where we have the Holy Spirit and we can now walk in the newness of life. All those who have faith in Jesus are made new. We are recreated. And so salvation at its essence is a recreation. It is a restoring what went wrong in the Garden of Eden through Jesus. A restored people with the restored purpose. And Romans 8, 18 to 23 describes how all of creation is groaning and is in pain and waits to be set free from bondage. And we ourselves groan in pain of this broken world. But we're waiting for our redemption that will come when Christ returns, when we're going to be resurrected. And in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. It's all about creation. From Genesis to Revelation, it is all about a God who is creating for the display of his glory. And so there is creation. And yes, there is a fall, but there is redemption. And then there is new creation. And that's what we have. That's who we are. That's what it means to follow Jesus. To taste right now this new creation. As we await our resurrection to live with him forever on the new earth. So as we wrap up. Finding your place in this story of creation that God is telling. Let me give you three thoughts as we wrap up. Your life has a purpose. This is the first thing you need to know. Your life has a purpose. Now, we all have the same purpose of displaying His glory. But within that reality that all of us have, you have a particular way, a unique way that you live out your purpose for God's glory in your life. For me, it's being a husband to Bonnie and four amazing children, two biological, two adopted. I have the privilege of of planting and leading a church. And this is the way that God has given me the joy of living out my purpose. But what about you? What's your purpose? You need to know it. You need to seek God and live your life every single day with intentionality and living out your unique purpose purpose as an image bearer of God. Don't waste a day. Second, your life has accountability. God created you. He owns you. You reflect his image. You basically are like his stamp. His seal is on you. Your, his image is imprinted on you. So you belong to him. He owns you by creation and by redemption through Jesus. And so you're not your own You can't dictate your purpose or live your own way according to your own agendas. You exist for the glory of God. And so you are accountable to God. You are responsible to God for how you use your time, your body, your resources, your talents. Everything about you that you have has been given to you as a gift from God. Life is a gift that we have to steward on behalf of God. We are accountable to live for something bigger than ourselves the glory in the kingdom of God. And so lastly, as you wrap up, your life has eternal value. Because you're made in God's image, because of creation, you have eternal value. God gave you being, your life matters. Don't believe the lies of the enemy and of this world, you matter. Don't focus on what you're lacking. Don't focus on your mess ups. Focus on who you are in Christ. Focus on who Jesus says you are, how nothing can separate you from the love of God and how there is now therefore no condemnation for all those who are in Christ Jesus. God is telling a magnificent story about creation and re-creation. And this gives you eternal value. Will you enjoy God and worship Him and walk in this truth? At your name, 
the mountains shake and crumble at your name the oceans roar and tumble at your name the angels will bow the earth will rejoice your people cry out Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise, Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, oh Lord, at your name, the morning breaks in glory. At your name, creation sings your story. At your name, the angels will bow, the earth will rejoice, your people cry out. Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name. Filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, O oh Lord. There is no one like our God. We will praise you, praise you. There's no one like our God. We will sing. We will sing, there is no one like our God. We will praise you, praise you, there's no one like our God. We will sing, we will sing, there is no one like our God. We will praise you, praise you, Jesus, you are God. We will sing, Lord of Shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise, Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise, Yahweh, Yahweh.
unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. It has been a joy to worship with you this morning and just consider how our God is so good to us and has created us for His purpose. And as we are dismissed from today's gathering, I have the Autry family here with us as an online gathered church. And it is such a bittersweet because I so love this family. I've loved getting to know Cody and Jennifer and there's Chase over there and there's Jackson's kind of hiding behind his hat and Sophia and Abel and Mason and Lane. And we have just loved this family, but he serves our country in the military. And as is the case where we live, God is moving them to Georgia and then to Corpus Christi. And so they're leaving us. And like I said, it's a sweet because I'm excited about God's call in your life, where he's going to take you. But man, it's bitter because I'm going to miss you and being in your home and drinking your coffee, Jennifer. It has been so good to just know you and see you serve our church. And, and so, Jennifer, if you want to share a few thoughts as, as, as we say farewell, by all means, sister. Um, I'd just like to say that we have really enjoyed being a part of Renewal. It was so good to find a faith family that is family-oriented and that we could serve together as a family. And we love our home group, that we are able to bring people in our home and just worship with them and love with them and just um, grow in God. And so we've really loved Renewal, and we are going to miss you all so much. One of, the, one of the best things about the Army is being able to travel with our family and meet new people, but uh, one of the most difficult things that we have to do is, uh, as you've heard over and over again, the word family. And uh, this time it feels even, even worse because we are truly leaving a, a family here. And uh, we love you and we're going to miss you. Well, Code and Jennifer, we're going to miss you and kids will miss you as well, but I know we'll see you again. I know you're retiring in a few years, and maybe you can come back our way and join us, and so you're always welcome to come back home. Um, so as we say farewell to the Autry family, let's just pray for them as we're dismissed today. Our Father in heaven, I thank you for the gift of the Autry family and how they have brought joy and how they have just brought themselves, and we have just been blessed by the relationships. And so I just ask for your blessing. I pray that you would just keep... Cody safe as he continues to serve our country so faithfully that you would use him to be on mission in his workplace, that you would bless Jennifer as a homeschool mom, that they would find a new church as they relocate, that you would just go before them, that you would just richly bless them. So I just thank you for this precious family and we just ask that you would continue to use them for the expansion of your kingdom for the display of your glory. And so we thank you, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.